Okay, so now we're going to go into the main, main part of this afternoon. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we kind of are thinking about the current moment that we're in on two tracks. And the past couple of days have been, I think, to some degree on the, a near-term track. How do, we, how do we cope? How do we get through an immediate crisis? But we also know we've got to keep thinking further out. And um, what we're about to hear is unbelievably instructive because, again, by looking to the past a little bit and not the too distant past, there is some incredible learning available to us. The uh, Mellon Foundation in 1998, I think, began a major program of support to symphony orchestras to about, it was grants to about 14 or 15 orchestras that included uh, convenings twice a year of staff, musicians, and trustees from those orchestras. And at one of those convenings in 2003, an ad hoc group of trustees, musicians, and staff got together in a bar to talk about what could be done about the then really lousy economy. And this was 2003 when we were in the depths of that last recession. And their conversation very quickly led them to thinking perhaps there is something about what's happening to us that needs to be looked at over the long term. Perhaps there's some underlying structural questions we need to understand better so that we are not plagued by the vagaries of the economy. And they seem to have a good time talking to each other because they talked for almost five years and trying to sort out what this was all about and seeing what they could make of it. And through those discussions came finally last spring a report, and it was called the Report of the Elephant Task Force, A Journey Toward New Visions for Orchestras. And, um, this afternoon, Bruce Kopick, who was one of the authors of that report, along with Henry Pearbrun and Hugh Long, uh, Bruce will pre present that vision or that set of visions for orchestras this afternoon. And the way we're, we've structured this is Bruce's presentation will take about 45 minutes, and following it, we're going to ask you at your tables to talk a little bit about what you've heard and to make some sense out of it and ask you to think about what has resonated for you in this report, what's missing, and what else you'd like to understand about it. And then we're going to have a panel conversation, which will include uh, Henry Pearbrun from the Cleveland Orchestra, Lowell Notaboom from the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, and Ari Solitoff from the Portland Symphony, a panel comprised of one trustee, one musician, and one staff member, in keeping with the design of the Elephant Task Force itself. Um, Bruce Kopick was formerly the president of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, the president of the St. Louis Symphony. He played an instrumental role at the League. He came to the League almost the same time I did and was the key person uh, charged with launching our Orchestra Leadership Academy. He has made an extraordinary contribution to our field, and please join me in welcoming Bruce. Um, I believe there are only two other members of the task force who are with us, uh, Larry Tamburi, who's right there, the president of the Pittsburgh Symphony, and Henry Parabrun, a uh, bass player in the Cleveland Orchestra, who you'll hear from later. Um, the rest have all gone to the various winds in a variety of ways. Um, the consultant to this project for five years was Paul Bullion, familiar to many of you. Um, and uh, I think Jesse alluded to this, but in addition to all the other things that the Mellon Foundation did for the orchestra field during that 10-year grant period, they also paid for all of the research, uh, for all of Paul Bullion's time, and for all of our travel approximately once a month for probably three or four years. We got to know the Chicago uh, Airport Hilton very well. Um, and um, we're grateful to the Mellon Foundation for this because as this project went on, we got increasingly excited and interested and sometimes contentious about its content. Um, so here's the report with some modifications. I know many of you have seen this. Um, for a lot of you, this will be completely new material. And because we have such a broad representation of orchestras from groups one through eight, I've modified the material a little bit to try to, um, to, to broaden the applicability of the rep uh, report a little bit. Um, one of the observations I would make up front is that I think, and we observed this as we went through our deliberations, is that the orchestras that comprise uh, the Elephant Task Force largely 
or if not almost completely group one orchestras, um, realized that there was a lot to learn, particularly in the area of community relations and um, uh, labor relations from the smaller orchestras. And so I think that uh, uh, <laughs> in, a, in a funny way, some of you who come from smaller orchestras will be saying no duh to some of this stuff, uh, which is a little bit more revelatory for some of the larger orchestras. Um, so um, actually what we said was we, it was open space. We had to put up stickers about what we wanted to talk about. And we really said, what are we going to do about the shitty economy? But um, you know, this is public conversation. So I'm, I'm going to get to the, to, the, to the conclusions. There are five main problems in the orchestra business. Cheap trustees, greedy musicians, unappreciative communities, arrogant music directors, and shitty management. <laughs> but we all know that's the problem, so why do we spend five years talking? A little more seriously, um, this was 2003, which seems now like child's play by comparison with what we're going through now. But at the time, it felt pretty serious. Orchestras were worried about cash. They were worried about balancing their budget. They were worried about all kinds of things. At that point, what seemed like to an unprecedented extent, and now we know that that was just the prelude. Big question. Are these problems cyclical or structural? We'll talk more about that later. What's at the core of the problem? Is money really the cause, or is there something else at work? I think the question sort of gives away the bias of the committee in this report. Um, we ended up focusing on four areas of concern. Communities, community relationships, which we defined as the ability of the orchestra organization to connect meaningfully to its community and creates true public value. That, that's what we might call the public value proposition. Second one, the ability of the orchestra constituents to work together in mutually supportive and cooperative ways. Think how much energy gets consumed on internal conflict, which could otherwise be applied to fundraising, community engagement, artistic endeavor. A, it's a big energy sink, internal culture. Artistic activities, the ability of the orchestra to deploy its resources broadly and effectively in service of the art form, the community, and the individuals in the organization. I think we would all recognize that sometimes our organizations have a tendency to talk to ourselves without necessarily relating to the communities that support us. And so that's what this is about. And finally, financial structure, which we defined as the ability of the orchestra to match cash resources with expenditures, either to maintain the status quo or to achieve viability or, God forbid, financial robustness. Um, I don't think we see much financial robustness, even in good times in this business. So we came up with a little chart that suggested that the financial problems are interrelated with all these other problems. And you can't just isolate the financial problems. They, in fact, may be manifestations of deficits or problems in the other area. Um, our first statistical adventure was to look at two member orchestras who, who provided, um, who had enough access, quick access to uh, data for the periods like 96 to about 2005. Because um, we wanted to develop a financial model on the basis of which we could project forward. Um, I'm not going to tell you which orchestras they are, because it's not really relevant because they all look the same at the end of the day. Um, and within each of those orchestra's statistics, we decided that there were f six drivers. Now, there's a certain arbitrariness to the decisions, but these are the decisions we made, that how many tickets you sell is a driver for your economic business. The percent that's on subscription versus the percent that's sold as singles is a driver because we all know that the transactional costs of single tickets are much, much higher than the transactional costs of subscription tickets. Ticket price increases over time. Big issue. Some of you were around for Jack McAuliffe's report two or three years ago, maybe San Francisco, whenever that was, when he began to, to establish the inverse correlation between attendance and price. So that we thought that was a big, important issue. 
the ratio of contributed revenue to total budget. Um, we'll talk more about that when we get to Flanagan's report. The ratio of endowment size to total expense. And the ratio of average expense increases to average annual revenue increases. So those are the six things we focused on. Now here's a, a straight line um, drawing, totally trended out without, with, the, with the variations removed for these two orchestras. These are two large group one orchestras. You see the little dotted lines on the bottom? Even though they live in very different markets and they are actually sort of slightly different orchestras in their financial characteristics, look how similar the revenue is. The red, the red dotted line and the green dotted line sit right on top of each other. One orchestra was better, quite frankly, than the other at managing its expenses. The green orchestra was able to keep the gap between expense growth and revenue growth a little bit narrower than the red orchestra, um, where it grew at about 5% a year for that seven year period. So, no, okay. So we decided to focus on orchestra A, which is the red orchestra, to dig a little deeper, and in particular, we wanted to do some projections. We wanted to say, what would happen if what we just saw in the prior screen was carried out over time? We did three cases. First thing we did is we took the exact trends that had been in the prior eight years that you saw in those charts, all the data that underneath that straight line, those two straight lines, and we just projected them forward. So if the rate of ticket price increase was 8%, we just hit 8% all the way out. If the rate of expense increase was 5%, we took 5% straight out, et cetera. Just a complete straight line projection. The second one, we said, let's do that, but let's modify those numbers with some cyclicality. And again, we were a little bit arbitrary, so we imagined the Dow going up and the Dow going down and the Dow going up again. And we adjusted the numbers, again, somewhat arbitrarily. It's just a projection. All we know about these numbers for sure is that they're wrong because they're just projections. Um, but we tried to enter some, some cyclicality into the numbers. And then in case number three, we said, what would happen if Orchestra A outperformed itself in every conceivable category at historically high levels of performance? So, for example, instead of 5% annual growth, what if we said Orchestra A could limit itself for five consecutive years to 2% annual growth. What if, um, I think we put an extra immediate $50 million in the endowment and then said, let's put eight more million dollars a year in that endowment. Let's say the stock market goes up eight or 10% every year. We, we shot the lights out in every single department for five consecutive years. Just to see what kind of impact that would have on the performance of Orchestra A. Of course, these are all hypothetical. All right, so this is scenario one. Well, by the year 2008-2009, in other words, by today, um, what was uh, a five and a half million dollar deficit in 2004 had become a 12.7 million dollar deficit by 2009-10. The orchestra was $57.6 million in debt, and that does not take into account the financing charges thereof. Now, the manager of Orchestra A, who doesn't happen to be here today, but we've talked about this, will tell you that by and large, this happened to Orchestra A. They did a lot of other stuff to counteract this, and they still run into some big deficits, but not nearly this bad. But this was the, the vision of this scenario is sort of what prompted Orchestra A to make some major changes in the way it went about its activities. So then we said, well, $57 million in debt by 910, you're out of business. You can't borrow that much money. You can't take that money from your endowment. You don't have access to that kind of capital. You can't afford the financing, even if you could have access to that kind of capital, out of business. In case two, we said, with the cyclicality, we don't need to go into the details of, of what was there. It mitigated it slightly, $10 million over the period, so there were only $48 million in debt. Um, still a completely unacceptable scenario. 
So then we said, let's shoot the lights out. Well, shooting the lights out actually made a big difference. Some people will say, so why don't you just shoot the lights out? Easy. You know, just limit your expenses to 2% a year for five years. Have the, make sure the stock market grows by 8 or 10% every year. <laughs> Easy. Shoot the lights out. And what this means is at the end of the game, assuming you can finance $12.5 million, in the middle of it, you've got $6.3 million of debt on what is what, a, a $37 million budget. Pretty manageable. You've got surpluses going forward. If you could shoot the lights out, OK, you could probably just get by. But nobody in the room, there were six musicians on the task force, four chairman of the board, and four executive directors, nobody thought it was remotely possible with all the staff in the world, with the best staff in the world, with the rosiest vision of what might happen, nobody thought this was possible. In other words, no one was willing to bet their future on that scenario. So, raise some questions. Could we really go on like this? Or do we have to look deeper, do some changes? Is the problem cyclic or structural? We had raging debates about whether the problem was a fixed cost structure problem or whether is it, is it a cyclicality problem. We'll get to that a little bit more. So in the middle of this, we hired uh, someone you've heard about, if you, if you read the blogs, a guy named Robert Flanagan. Mellon Foundation paid for Robert Flanagan to answer, to do two things. They asked him to investigate the cyclicality question versus the structural question. They gave him 17 years of OSR data. He did all kinds of regression analyses and all kinds of stuff. And he came back with an answer we'll talk about in just a second. Um, he al we also said, could you make some kind of predictive model? At the end of the day, he said, I'll try. Came back and said, you know what? It's impossible. The data isn't good enough. There's not enough of it, not enough time. I can't possibly make you a model that the Evansville, Indiana Orchestra could take, fill in the blanks, and predict what might happen to the future. Because that's what we hoped would happen. We hoped we could be able to develop some machine some calculator that everybody could use to say, I mean, to, to run scenarios. And it turned out to be just too ungainly a task even for a very fancy economist at the Stanford Business School. But let's talk about Flanagan for a second. That's the cohort, much, much wider cohort of information than we had in our little informal elephant, elephant task force meetings. And the key finding on the cyclicality is that it's versus the structural, is that it's both. It is both a structural problem or phenomenon, and it is also a cyclical problem. And our colleague Hugh Long drew some really beautiful charts, which I'm going to show you here, if you can see them. Um, Flanagan developed a term of art called the performance income gap, or the pig. Um, <laughs> and that's the yellow line. Now, I have to say that Mr. Flanagan had a bias that there was good revenue and bad revenue. Good revenue was the kind of revenue you get at the, at the box office, and bad revenue was all the other stuff you have to do to make up for what you have to cover from what you don't get at the box office. And we had some discussions, shall we say, about that as well. Um, but here's what emerges. That, and this is based on real data. It's a slightly conceptual drawing, but you'll get the idea here. The light blue line, that's revenue from performances for all these orchestras over time. And the red line is what it costs to produce those things. And it produced an ever-increasing pig, pig gap, we call it, performance income gap. Um, now, as he notes on the right, it was more than filled by non-performance income of a variety. Um, and he also noted, and this is an important thing when it comes to business model issues, which this report really isn't about. But there's no particular reason to assume that performance and non-performance revenue are unrelated. In other words, size of audience matters. Because larger audience, larger people from whom to raise, larger group of people from whom to raise money. Um, so even Mr. Flanagan, who wasn't wild about the idea of, of philanthropic income, acknowledged that a larger audience could possibly generate more contributed income. Um, now, this is really interesting, if you ask me. 
Look at producer prices. That's the CPI. So the revenue increased more than CPI. But we all know that attendance went down. So what's that mean? The prices of tickets went up. So we continually raised prices from this period, from 96 to 2004, 80, sorry, 87 to 2004, at a, great, a, a, a rate significantly higher than CPI, year over year over year over year. And the expenses, incre performance expenses, increased even more significantly than the rate of inflation over time. Um, so thus creating the famous pig. Now, in this chart, what's interesting is that during this same period of time, we got so good at fundraising and creating alternate sources of income, but largely fundraising, that we were able to offset the ever-increasing pig with non-performance revenue or gifted income which produced what he, what Mr. Flanagan called a gentle or fragile trend toward surplus. Um, so that's why some of us felt, despite all the turbulence, we were sort of getting along okay. Remember there was a big crisis in 91 or 92 around the time of the Wolf Report and the sky was falling, and then all of a sudden, during the Clinton administration, the market went up like mad, and we said, ah, oh, there was no problem. Then we woke up in 2003, and there was a big problem again. And then, sort of 2003 through 2007, we got comfortable again, and here we are in 2009, and we have a problem on our hands. So, finally, we, entered, we, we added this notion of cyclicality, which is the squiggly line. Now, here's the fundamental question. If in a straight line way there's a, fra a fragile trend towards surplus, do we have the staying power to run a million dollar deficit one year or a hundred thousand dollar deficit the next year? Um, and do we really, is that really where the squiggly line lives with respect to our expenses? And I'm going to show you some numbers in just a second, some charts that shows you that actually this conceptual drawing is wrong because it implies that there's as much surplus going on as there is deficit. And that's not the way we behave. It's a nice conceptual idea, but it's not actually the way we behave. Here's a simpler way of looking at it. This is kind of the way we behave with a few exceptions. I got some charts to show you in just a second. That's, if you imagine the straight line at the top of those hand-drawn red inverted humps. We just managed to balance the budget at the top of the cycle. We just get there. Maybe we have a little surplus, but we incur big deficits along the way. How do we finance those deficits? We take more from our endowment. We transfer from our endowment. We have lines of credit. We sometimes let our bills go to 100 or 150 days. We carry deficits, right? Carrying deficits is very expensive, and it doesn't get us out of the hole. And in going back and looking at about eight years of OSRs for all eight groups over the last week or so, what I discovered is that a lot of orchestras suddenly have one year in which they have a giant surplus. My old orchestra, St. Paul's, is a classic case. Wiped out a $1.5 million deficit in 1995 in one year. Big fundraising campaign to wipe out the sins of the past and then they were even Steven again and went on. That story has been repeated many, many times. That's an expensive way to wipe out a deficit. Now, if you turn it up upside down and said, imagine if instead of doing the red chart, we did the green chart. If we budgeted so that the line, the expense line, was always at the bottom of the cycle instead of the top, look at all the gravy we might have to cover exciting artistic projects, to make investments in infrastructure, to do research and development, whole ki all kinds of interesting possibilities. Now, I've got to give credit where credit is due here. Um, we had a big meeting of the Elephant Task Force with Mr. Flanagan in July of 2006, I guess, and Lowell Notaboom got up and 
took his pencil and started making these charts, and we decided to incorporate them into our presentation because it, it gets to the quintessence of the issue so clearly. Wouldn't that be beautiful if you were always accumulating surplus that you could use for a whole bunch of things? Middle road might be that you save in the good times so you can pay it back down in the bad times. Um, self-explanatory, but we don't behave this way. Now, here's, this is proof that we don't behave this way. This came straight off the OSRs, years 2000 through 2007, and I'm sure there's some mistakes in the OSRs. I'm sure I made some mistakes transcribing them, but at order of magnitude, I guarantee you this information is correct. This is the percent deficit by groupings of orchestra. There's group one, the dark blue. It's lived the entire deficit as a group, or higher, the entire decade so far, with the exception of 2007, as a group in deficit. Group two, groups two and three together haven't done much better, but they got a little bit above the line in 2004, and last year something magical happened, and collectively groups two and three had a 3% surplus in 2007. Uh, that's right around the time of the height of the market, as I recall. Now, we don't know if these orchestras took 19% draws, or did lots of transfers, or had one-time gifts. The OSR doesn't reveal that. This is just aggregated high-level data. And what I thought would be, what I thought was going to be borne out, I secretly hoped was going to be borne out, that groups four and seven would prove to be the financial stars. They're just slightly better than the other groups. Um, they're more agile, they tend to be a little bit more community responsive, they tend not to have such big fixed cost structures. And in fact, groups uh, four through seven, the yellow line, recovered a little faster than groups one through three. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And this all sort of falls under the category of interesting stuff. It's not necessarily supposed to lead you to a precise conclusion. So then I said, I superimposed the Dow. Um, and now we've limited it to, well, this is groups one and two, is the purple line, which is almost obscured by um, the magenta line. And when you squish this together, it looks like all orchestras pretty much behave, by and large, the same way, when you aggregate all these orchestras and just make two great big divisions. Now, as Jesse pointed out to me, groups one and two together combine for 83 to 85% of all financial activity in the entire business, groups one through eight. So um, basically the whole industry in the aggregate lived below the line, while the Dow Jones was just all over the place. Now I don't know, quite know what that means. There's obviously a lag on how we respond to what happens in the market, but the market doesn't affect just our endowments. The market affects corporate contributions, it affects personal contributions, it affects Throughout the philanthropic sector, the thing it probably affects least is ticket sales. Um, again, I thought that was kind of interesting. And if we projected those two lines in their current upswing at the end, into eight and nine, there'd be a big disconnect between where the Dow was and where our budgets were. Now here's the good news in all these slides. You notice how all these deficits are in the three to five percent range max? That's not a very big adjustment to have to make, if you think about it. I mean, the Dow is down 40%, maybe more some days. But we're only, as a field, functioning 3 to 5% below balancing our budget. Maybe it isn't such a crisis after all, unless we're doing 14 to 15% draws to support that. Um, then I focused in on group one kind of the poster child for um, what I would call behaving as if there's nothing going on outside. Um, group one is a group, now you gotta remember that 1% of group one, Steve, what do we say, 1% of, of, 1 of group one's activity is $10 million. So if group one was at three or 4%, Deficit, that's 30 or 40 million dollars of deficit. That's a lot of money. 
Um, and again, with the Dow Jones going all over the place. So you can just think about that. Um, and then I tried to just reconcile the numbers in a way so we could superimpose the Dow Jones and the expenses, average expenses of group one orchestras on top of each other. And I, now, what this represents is one third of the average annual expense of each group one orchestra. So 10,000 is, 10, is really 30 million. And those are the actual Dow Jones average numbers based on month <coughs> and numbers throughout this period of time. And what was striking to me is that we do follow the Dow. So there is some correlation between what happens in the Dow Jones average and our behavior. But we don't seem to adjust on the expense side as much as the Dow does. And we seem to, have in the last little bit here, to have gotten a little bit wary that the Dow Jones actually grew faster than our expenses did. So we didn't, we didn't um, I don't know quite what the expression is, we didn't let go completely on expense control in the last couple of years, even though the Dow was racing to the, the limit. So I thought it was an interesting question posed at this point. Going back to the green, the green um, Christmas tree chart, upside down Christmas tree, um, what if your bylaw said you had to have a 5% surplus? What would that, what kind of opportunity would that force for your orchestra? It would guarantee, to the extent that you could make good on the, on the, on the requirement, but you always had money to cover the unexpected bad, bad year. They would guarantee that you had money for tools, for recordings, for special projects. You could participate in the Golihoff Commission coming up or whatever. So just think about that as a way of, instead of saying, how can I possibly get the expenses down low enough to balance with slightly optimistic revenue projections, because we all did that, we all do that every year, what if we said, OK, here's my best case scenario for revenue, and I'm going to budget expenses 5% lower than that? It would be interesting. OK, Flanagan dealt with a whole bunch of other stuff that we didn't ask him to. And that's a, where a lot of the flap came from. If you read the blogs around Flanagan, I'm not going to go into it. Just to acknowledge that he did that, it's in his report. You can download it, I think, from the Mellon site. And there's plenty of stuff in the blogosphere, pro and con, if you want to read further about that. So here's the key questions. Given all this, um, are you confident that the way we do things, these two things go together. Are you confident that the tried and true ways of thinking about our orchestras is the way to sustain our organizations over time? Um, we've got this pattern of accumulated deficit, declining audience, we pay off the deficit, we break into contracts. Amazing number of orchestras over this period of time. Um, I think 17 out of the 62 orchestras either went out of business or got reformed during the period of time. Very high number. Doesn't, not a lot of orchestras in any given year, but one or two a year for 17 years adds up to a lot of orchestra. Um, Managing from crisis to crisis. Is that really the way we want to run our organizations? Or do you want to think about it differently? And what about this idea that the problem is not that you can't do the latter stuff because you don't have the money, but that you don't have the money because you don't do the latter stuff? Because when we cut, what do we do? We always cut to the core. We say, we're going to do our core missions. We're going to put concerts on stage because that's who we are. And all the other stuff, the community engagement stuff, the education stuff, malheureusement, all that stuff gets canceled because we can't afford it. Maybe, this group posits, that's upside down. Maybe that's wrong. So just to remind you, you can, I won't read them, just get your bearings again on the four areas of concern. And we're going to go into some vision statements now. Remember this chart. We said, OK, that's all pretty depressing, bad news, negative. So we said, let's, let's try to get out of the box here a little bit. 
Let's challenge the status quo. Let's be intentionally provocative. Let's not get into, you know, providing tablets and saying, Paul Beecham should do that at the Baltimore Symphony, but rather, here's some things you might think about. We call it the Petri dish as opposed to the prescription drug. Um, let's try to do this in an atmosphere of respect. Let's try to allow ideas to develop. And we came up with a series of visions. And one of the most amazing things, if you've ever read, read Warren Bennis's book, Great Groups, this was a great group. We all got along famously. We respected each other. We could disagree violently with each other and then put our arms around each other and have a good old hug. Um, it was a wonderful group of people. Um, but we all wanted it to be better. We wanted to reduce these ideas down to their simple, radical essence. And we wanted to describe a different future. And we did put a little bit of limit. We wanted, we wanted to say, we want this to be remotely possible to achieve, not impossible to achieve. And ultimately, we just keep reflecting the fact that this isn't the elephant task force work to figure out. This is all 120 of you in your individual orchestras. That's your work to figure out what works in your community. Because what works in Tulsa probably won't work in Quad Cities. Um, there might be a good idea you can steal from another orchestra, but there are no tablets here. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So, as we read these, I would challenge you, you don't have to answer in public, you don't have to give confession, but ask yourself if these statements reflect the following things. They, do they reflect the way your organization thinks? Do they reflect the way your organization behaves? Do they reflect your priorities? Do they reflect how you spend your money? Okay, so in its community engagements, an orchestra might see community engagement as the core mission. The most important thing. Um, public radio has learned a lot about this. Um, they're in the business of creating patrons. They give away their content, and they spend a massive amount of energy getting you to be a member and to be part of the team. Obama did that, too. Engagement of the community as the core mission of the organization. That enlightened self-interest would motivate not arrogance, not we don't do that, or that's not part of our core mission, but enlightened self-interest might motivate your organization's behavior. And that you'd think first about serving the community rather than delivering product to the community. That's 180 degrees from the way most of us function. You know, we always say it's got to be about the music. Well, what if, it, what if being a good citizen would help the cause and it had nothing to do with music? Why do you think corporations volunteer for Habit for Humanity? What if the entire, I'm not picking on you, Paul, I'm just watching The Wire so I have Baltimore on the mind. Um, um, what if the entire Baltimore Symphony staff, board, and orchestra went out and did Habitat for Humanity in the name of the Baltimore Symphony? That might change the community's perception of the Baltimore Symphony. Nothing to do with music. What if we thought about inspiring people to make music rather than telling them how good we are? That would be an interesting idea. And what if we had enough faith in our communities to believe they could actually tell us what might be a good thing to do. We just had that in St. Paul. Some of you may know we're doing an International Chamber Orchestras Festival. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary, and four great chamber orchestras are coming. That wasn't the management's idea. It was actually the board's idea. They said, why do you want to go to Europe again? Why do you want to make another recording? Why do you want to go to New York and do a big blowout in New York? Why don't you do it in the Twin Cities? Why don't you have the world come to St. Paul? It was a better idea. And it came from the community through our board. It didn't come from the management. In internal culture, what if we really embraced a culture of partnership and responsibility? Responsibility. Everybody. What if we valued by investing in personal and professional growth? 
We've made a real financial commitment to that. What if we got better at reinforcing people's accomplishments? What if we created a more positive culture? And what if we functioned not as a hierarchical CEO-driven organization, but as a managing partner, you know, like in a law firm, accountable to the other partners? The CEO is accountable to the other partners, not just to the board, but to the other partners in the organization. What would that imply? Okay, artistic activities. We tend to say, oh, that's the music director's responsibility. That's the orchestra's responsibility. God forbid it's the board's responsibility. What if everybody was responsible for the artistic growth of the organization? And what if we held those responsible accountable for imaginative leadership? Truly accountable. What would it look like? Does it matter about the artistic growth and development of your board members? I think it does. I think they become better board members. I mean, it's enlightened self-interest. I think it matters a lot, the artistic growth of your staff members. The more they understand about what the orchestra does, the more they're engaged in it themselves, the more devoted they're going to be as staff members. What if we really, instead of talking about research and development, I salute the League for what the League is doing in research and development. It's the first concerted attempt to do something. What if we really invested in research and development? We probably don't even know what research and development means yet. A tool can tell us about that later. And what if we really got outside the concerts hall and did a bunch, not throwaway stuff, not July 4th concerts. What if we did really interesting artistic activity outside the concerts hall, like the um, Walker's Merce Cunningham presentation in the quarry, 40 miles outside of Minneapolis this fall. International event in a quarry. It was, music, it was a musical event, too. OK, on the financial side, what if we were revenue-driven instead of expense-driven? I know there's lots, this is code for a lot of stuff. Gets a lot of people scared. But what if it was really true? Most of the world runs this way. I don't know why we don't. What if we made sure that we cared about the financial well-being of the people a generation from now? If we behaved in a way, if we conserved our resources so that people who run the place and live in the place and work in the place 30 years from now will have the resources, balance, aspirations. Can't cancel a European tour, oh my god. Can't cancel this recording. Can't cancel this Mahler too. That would be terrible. Well, how terrible is it really? If the cost of that is a broken labor contract or a big deficit that you can't afford. And I know, and I would say again, the smaller orchestras are better than the larger orchestras at dealing with this issue of balancing aspirations. What if we developed a budgeting system akin to the way we most of us handle our endowments. What if we smooth things out over time? This is Larry Tamburi's brilliant idea. What if you had a three-year average spending policy for operating expenses, and that you were limited by a certain percentage in a certain formula, so that you'd be forced to make choices and you'd stay within certain financial parameters? How do we most, most of us do this? I, I don't mean to sound unfair, but most of us say, what we'd like to do, and we add up the cost, and we say, how are we going to pay for it? Oops, we're spending more money than we have. We're going to have to cut something back. And that's the basic budget process in most orchestras I know. This might be a better, more disciplined way of running things. What if we shared risks and rewards for everybody? Upside rewards, downside risks. And that means the players, that means the management. Maybe it means the board, too. Um, OK, so obviously there's lots to think about. I've probably wildly exceeded my time. I actually haven't. That's 40 minutes. Ha, Jesse. <laughs> you owe me five minutes. OK, so um, Jesse made these questions. And I think they're just to stimulate some conversation. What resonates? What's missing? 
or would you like to understand more? Now, you all know the full report is available. And it's a sketchy document. It's, it's just meant to hint at where you might go. Um, so, Jesse, I'm going to turn this over to you now. Thank you all very much.